Kings chapter 3, if you uh, would like to, in your Bible, 1 Kings chapter 3, it's towards the beginning, it goes through the Samuels, if you run into First and Second Samuel, then it's 1 Kings uh, chapter 3. While you're turning there, I want to say to moms, just, I, I know with movements in our society, a lot of focus has been taken off of just being a mom. You know, and I, I don't disagree that women can do anything a man can do. I don't disagree with that at all. But I don't want any woman to forget that, that God made you the mother because he knew how critical that was and he couldn't trust us with that. <laughs> Amen. So you're so vital to our church and to our families. And so I hope, I hope today be a blessing to you. Uh, if you found 1 Kings chapter 3, if you would, please stand in honor of God's word. If you're able, we stand here. You say, why is that? Well, in the Old Testament, whenever they'd read the, uh, the, the law, the Bible at that point, they'd stand for it. So we keep doing it now today. Uh, old, old school tradition. I like old school things. Makes me feel good. Verse number 16 of chapter 3 of the 1 Kings book, the book of 1 Kings. Uh, verse number 16 of chapter 3. I want to say real quick, this is a passage that was designed to show the wisdom of King Solomon. That was the whole design of it, but there's some things we can learn from it. Verse 16, Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. Verse 17, And the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the, in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. By the way, could you imagine a house with two pregnant women? Two of them. The emotions of that house. Whew. God is good. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house, verse 18. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house. Save we two in the house. Specifies just us two. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. Basically smothered it would be the term we'd use. And she rose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. So, verse 22, letting us know, they're kind of arguing right here in front of the king. Thus they spake before the king. Verse number 23. Then said the king, this is King Solomon. So he's saying this out loud. The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but the, thy, thy son is dead, and my son is the living. Quite a predicament. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought him a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to one and half to the other. Then spake the woman, whose the living child was, uh, unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, O my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it, but the, but the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it, she is the mother thereof. And all, the, and all Israel heard the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, and they saw that the wisdom of God was in him, to do judgment. Let's pray one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. Ask that you would speak to the hearts of your people today and be a blessing to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I should keep the titles reserved for the end because they kind of give away a lot of the sermon, but here we go. The title this morning is Growing by Going with Sacrificial Love. Growing by Going with Sacrificial Love. Love. I want to take a minute to reminisce about some things my mother taught me here on Mother's Day. Uh, listen to them and see if your mother may have taught you some of the same lessons. My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. She said, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. It's a job well done. 
My mother taught me about religion. She'd say, you better pray that comes out of the carpet, boy. <laughs> My mother taught me about time travel. If you don't, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week, boy. <laughs> My mother taught me logic. Because I said so, that's why. <laughs> All right. <laughs> My mother taught me foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. <laughs> my mother taught me irony. I love this one. Still say this. I say it to my kids now. Keep crying and I'll give you a reason to cry or give you something to cry about. <laughs> That's irony, isn't it? My mother taught me about the science of osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your dinner. <laughs> my mother taught me about the weather. This room looks like, your room of yours looks like a tornado came through it. My mother taught me the circle of life. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. <laughs> a lot of moms use that one, amen. True, by the way, kids. <laughs> they can plead insanity, and they'll get away with it. Just saying. My mother taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. <laughs> My mother taught me about envy. There are millions of less fortunate, fortunate children in this world why don't, who don't have wonderful parents like you do. Thanks. My mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait until we get home. <laughs> My mother taught me about receiving. So thankful for that lesson. You're going to get it when your father gets home. <laughs> My mother taught me how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. By the way, I successfully didn't eat any vegetables and I still made it to six foot one, so. <laughs> My mother taught me about genetics. You act just like your father. My mother taught me about my roots. Shut that door behind you, you weren't born in a barn. Glad she let me know. My mother taught me about wisdom. When you get to, my, to be my age, you'll understand. By the way, isn't that so true? You're a teenager, your parents don't know anything. You become an adult, you call your parents because you have questions about everything. <laughs> and you know they understand. My mother taught me about justice. This one's good. One day you'll have kids and I hope they turn out just like you. <laughs> and that's justice, amen. <laughs> true stories and sayings are sometimes the funniest, aren't they? Moms, we love, we appreciate you this morning. As I said, this passage is actually not really focused on the mothers in the passage. It's more a passage to show us, and it was put in the Bible to show us that Solomon, after asking God for wisdom, had a lot of wisdom. A very wise man, even at a young age. Uh, but we can see some characteristics of a great mother from this passage. Look back at the uh, story with me. I'll kind of tell it to you how it played out. It was a sad situation, really. It's, it's a sad story all around. Um, but it, it comes to pass that two women that happened to be harlots, so they were, they were single, they weren't married, uh, but they lived together. And uh, that made things probably be more affordable, made things easier. And man, how crazy would it be? But they both get pregnant at the same time. And they're, I mean, so close that they have a baby three days apart. And as I said, the, the emotions that would have ran wild in that house. I know when there's just one pregnant woman in my house, it is terrifying. Um, <laughs> Say, that's not true. No, it is, because you never know what you're getting into at any day. So we'll, we'll name these women, or, or I guess I'll just call one woman, woman A and one woman B, okay, for understanding, because when you read the passage, they don't have names. It just says the one and the one, and sometimes that's confusing. So woman, woman A, if you really want to give her a name, we'll say Andrea, because that starts with an A. And woman B, we'll say Brenda, I don't know, because it starts with a B. So if you want to give them names, Andrea and Brenda, but I'll call them woman A, woman B. So these two women, woman A and woman B, living together, both have a baby at the same time, and now they're all of a sudden standing in front of King Solomon. Cool. No, I, I think that's cool that the king would be uh, open enough to even have two harlots. By the way, uh, the, the fact that they points out their harlots, I think just to show us that they were women that were married or anything of that nature. Uh, but really, the king cared even about two harlot women. 
And what a great picture of our Savior because our Savior cares about any of us. He never looks at us and says, oh, well, that's a wicked, dirty sinner, so I don't, I don't love them. No, we realize we're all wicked and dirty sinners. I'm so glad God loved us and takes time for us. And so anyways, these two women come before the king, and uh, we'll say woman B's got the baby. I'm going to guess because we'll, we'll find out soon. So the two women show up, and the woman A tells her story. She says, king... Me and this woman live in the same house. It's just us two. Nobody else lives there. Nobody even came in or out of the house. And here's what happened. Now, she doesn't exactly know what happens, but she's probably, like any good woman, she's, put the, she's figured it out. Mothers do that, can't they? Mothers can put things together. I don't know how. I had, I had three siblings. There's four of us. And my mom always knew which one did it. Didn't matter who did it, but my mom always knew. And so this woman has put it together in her mind. She says, okay, here's what happened. It's me and her. We live in the same house. Well, one night she overlaid, woman B overlaid or smothered her own child. And because her child died in the middle of the night, she came, took my son and put her son in my bed. And then she kept my son. She said, then I woke up. And you could imagine the fear and just... I mean, the, the emotions in this passage aren't stressed on, but I can't help but read it and think about the thought of waking up uh, to a baby that's not breathing. No, every mom knows, at least with the first baby, maybe, maybe after that, you sometimes just get up to look over and make sure that little baby's chest comes up and down, don't you? Amen. They're so precious to you. Um, I know my wife, you know, she has a, it's a, it's a, a crib that comes up right next to the bed for the baby and both of our children slept in cribs like that and I know she sleeps on that side she looks at that side and I could basically be dead or somewhere else she wouldn't notice or care because when, <laughs> when it comes to that baby that's all that matters and so this woman wakes up and goes to feed her son except the son's not eating the son's not drinking the son's not moving um, I understand this was back in the day when they didn't just, couldn't just turn on a lamp, so there's no light in the room. Maybe she's decided to light a candle, and she realizes that this baby's not even alive. And the sorrow and, and the emotions that overturn her, but then as the sun rises and the light kind of starts shining into the house, she realizes, this isn't my son. No, a mother knows. A mother knows. Yeah. Even if it looks like a potato to everybody else, that newborn, it, it, mommy knows. So she, she realizes, this isn't my baby. And of course, she probably confronted the other woman. We don't have that confrontation, but I'm sure that was pretty heated. So they take it to the king. So she tells the king this story. So the king listens out to woman A's story, and he says, okay, woman B, Brenda, go ahead and tell me your side of the story. And her side of the story is actually not very elaborate. By the way, that's not a good sign. Kids, if you're going to lie to your parents, make sure it's an elaborate... No, I'm just kidding. Don't lie to your parents. That's a joke. Joke. Don't lie to your parents. Being honest always is better. But if you look, woman B's story is pretty short. She just basically says this. No, she's wrong. The living son is mine and the dead one's hers. That's all she really says, in a sense. So now, imagine being Solomon. You're the king and you are standing before two mothers, one of whom lost their baby. I mean, their baby is dead and now the other one... Somebody's got to end up with this child and raise it. One's going to go through a lot of sorrow, and one's going to, one deserves to have their child back. And he's got to make such a difficult decision. He can't do a DNA test. He can't, you know, there's no science that can help prove it. So he's got to solve the problem quickly. And so he makes a very difficult decision in verse number 23. In fact, 23 is really him figuring out this is a difficult decision. Verse 23, I'll read it again. He says, The one saith, This is my son. And the live that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. He's saying, you're both saying the same thing. You're both saying, my son's the living son, her son's the dead son. Who is right, who is wrong? And he's got to figure this out. Uh, a lot like a mom, you've got to make those kind of hard decisions sometimes. You've got to figure out the lies and got to weed your way through it. So then the wisest man to ever live makes his decision. Very simply, in verse 24, uh, he says, All right, bring me a sword. And all of a sudden, I can, I can feel the heart drop of both moms probably, but especially the mom that the child actually belonged to. A sword for what? What do you need a sword for? And he says, All right, here's the plan. Give me the child. Or, divide, or he didn't say, Give me the child. He says, All right, cut that baby right down the middle. Now, that sounds gruesome and horrific. Don't worry, kids. He had no plans of, of cutting the baby in half. He knew what he was doing. He's the wisest man to ever live. 
But why would Solomon say to divide the child in half? That's just, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why would you do that? He says, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm I'm to cut this baby in half, and you can both have half. You both walk away with something. Because he knew something about a real mom. No, right, let me say that again. Solomon, the wisest man aside from Jesus Christ, God incarnate, to ever live, knew something about a real mom. A real mom has sacrificial love. A love that puts her child before herself any and every time. Everybody knows mom's love. Everybody can probably think back to their own mother who probably put aside her desires, her dreams, her hobbies, everything for you, most likely. And exactly as Solomon thought, as he says, divide it and give half to each, verse 26 tells us, Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king. For her bowels yearned upon her son. The bowels is, I know that sounds weird to us. It's like your bowels, like, like you know, you're gassy? Or what are you saying? They're yearning? Well, the bowels in the biblical times, it was what described everything inside. And mainly it meant your heart. And, and what it was saying there is her heart hurt. The thought, of losing, the thought of losing her child hurt, but the thought of her child not having life hurt more. And so woman A says, no, no, king, don't do it. Don't do it. Just give her the child. Just give him, just give him to her. Don't, don't harm the baby. Just give him to her. Because in her sacrificial love, she said, I would rather him get raised by the woman that's not actually his mother than for him not to get a chance at life at all. The other woman's response, woman B, lets us know that she really wasn't the mother. Um, her, her child has already, is already dead. Her She's probably taken time to mourn that. She's come to terms with that. But now she thinks, I can't live in the same house with the woman raising a child the same age as my kid. I can't deal with that. I can't see that kid laugh. I can't see that kid learn to walk, learn to talk, grow, become a young boy. I can't watch that. So her response is, is, is evil, really. But look what it says. Uh, and at the end of verse 26, it says, But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. By the way, that's just selfishness. You'd rather just not there be a kid than have to watch a woman raise her rightful son. And so, uh, of course, Solomon in his wisdom goes, Okay, give woman A the baby back. Andrea, whatever you want to call her. She's the mother. Because Solomon knew a real mom would rather give up her son than have him killed. A real mom would rather give up her son than have him killed. What a great example of a mother's love and sacrifice. Today on Mother's Day, I, I try to think about all the things that women go through raising children. Now, I know, we have a part too. And I'm not trying to say that men don't have a part. We have a part. But our part... And any man will be willing to admit it is not near as active as your part. As happy as I am to, to play with my kids and to discipline my kids and to help feed my kids and, and bathe my kids and all those things, I still go to work. And while I'm at work, hours and hours of things happen. My wife doesn't watch what she wants on TV because you can't hear the TV over a two and three year old. My wife doesn't get to say, I don't want to change this diaper. I, I do it all the time, all the time. Uh, magically, when a diaper, I got to take out the trash, or I just remembered something at the church. <laughs> Anyways, here's a great example, and this story is a very heart-wrenching story too, uh, but it was actually, this is a true account from a Jewish concentration camp. True account from a Jewish concentra concentration camp. A man named Solomon Rosenberg, his wife, their two sons, and his two parents were all placed in a Nazi concentra concentra concentration camp. They were labor camps. What it meant was, if you can't work, you don't live. Upon entry to this Nazi labor camp, Solomon knew his parents were going to die. At the age they were, he knew there was going to come a point where they couldn't physically do the work and they were going to be killed. Some time passed and that happened. And he lost his parents. He lost his own mother, which was probably pretty hard for him. But he knew 
the next person to go was going to be his youngest son. His youngest son's name, uh, I think it was David. I have it in here. Let me look. Yes, David. David, he described, was a frail boy. You know, he just kind of always been sickly. Kind of always needed a little more help and attention than his older son, Joshua. So every day, it's not like they worked as a family. The way it worked was every day, men were sent here to do men's work, and women were sent to do some women's work, and children were sent to do what children could do. And they'd always come back they, at a certain time point. They'd always get back to the same camp. And so every day, Solomon, and I found it funny, his name was Solomon, but Solomon Rosenberg would come back to that camp and frantically and with panic in his heart, look for his family. Because he never knew what day one of his family wasn't coming home. So every day he'd come home, or he'd get back, and, and his family, when they'd find each other, they'd just get together and hold each other and cry and get through it. And one day he comes through in the same way he always did, looking for his family, kind of in a panic, of course, never knowing if that's the day something bad might have happened to his kid. He sees Joshua sitting in a corner crying. Not a good sign, his oldest son. So he runs over to his oldest son. He said, no, Joshua, don't tell me it happened. Don't, don't tell me it happened. And Joshua, in tears, comes up from his prayers and says, Dad, they, they took David. He couldn't work today. And his the dad, of course, Solomon, starts crying. He says, where's your mother? Where's your mother? He said, don't worry, Dad. Mom went with him. The end of that story is that Solomon's wife rather than allowing her child to go and be killed by himself, turned her life over to so that her son didn't have to be afraid and die alone. And you think about a story like that and you go, I, I can't understand a mother's love. It's as hard for me to understand as God's love. And then I thought, God and moms have a lot in common. Now, don't go crazy with that statement. I'm not trying to say, now, my wife is perfect, but I'm yours, your mom, I'm sorry. No, I'm, uh, I'm not trying to say your mom is perfect or anything like that. But what I mean is, the only thing I can compare to a mother's selfless, sacrificial love is God's selfless, sacrificial love. What do I mean by that? Very simple. God gave Himself... He died on a cross so that we don't have to suffer. Let me tell you the whole story abbreviated. We've got a little time. I purposely wanted to be able to focus on this. About 2,000 years ago, most of you have probably heard the story of a man named Jesus. Jesus was not just a good man. He was not just a preacher. He was not just a prophet. He was God in the flesh. God made man and dwelt, came down as a man and dwelt among us. And so about 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, truly born of a virgin uh, named Mary. He lived a perfect and sinless life. 33 years, 33 and a half, depending on who you ask. He never committed one sin. He never did one thing wrong. He was the perfect child. By the way, he had brothers and sisters. You know Mary all the time through that. Why can't you just be more like Jesus? <laughs> So if you think it's hard having a good or perfect older sibling, it wasn't Jesus at least, amen. But Jesus really did live a perfect and sinless life. And then he was convicted of, of things that he actually didn't do. Witnesses couldn't agree to his story, but everybody hated him so much because of the, the perfect man that he was that he died on a cross. Well, first, before he got to that cross, he was beaten he had his beard plucked, he was spit on, he was yelled at. Uh, basically, the most heinous things you could ever imagine somebody going through. Uh, and I don't want to get gra too graphic, but when they would hit men with the cat of nine tails, not, not just Jesus, but any men that would get whipped with the cat of nine tails, it would have shards of like glass and bone and sharp things on the end of it, so that whenever it would hit, it wouldn't just whip you, it would wrap around you, and it would snag into your flesh, and then it would pull flesh and stuff away right from your bones and skin. I mean, he went through... Just the most tragic thing you could ever imagine. And then they hung him on a Roman cross. But not even the normal way. 
The normal way would be to just tie their wrists and their ankles. No, they went above and beyond to cause as much pain as possible. So they nailed him to a cross. They dropped, they lifted that cross and dropped it into a hole so that all of his bones and all the tendons and everything would tear and break as it hit the bottom. And he went through agony. He never complained. He could have called 10,000 angels to get him down off that cross, but he didn't because he knew somebody has to pay for our sins. I don't feel like I have to argue too much with us to know that we're all sinners. None of us are perfect. If you don't believe me, come hang out with my two-year-old. You'll learn that even from a young age, we're all sinners. My two-year-old now knows how to look at me and with a glare and say no. And by God's grace, he's still alive today. Amen. <laughs> But because we're sinners, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Meaning, what we deserve because we are sinners is to die and go to hell. That's what it means. I know that sounds... You say, well, God wouldn't send anyone to hell. You're right, God wouldn't. Because just like a mother's sacrificial love, God said, I will come down as man. I will suffer as a man. I will die for your sins as a man so that you don't have to. In fact, John 3, 16 and 17 says this, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Amen. That's why God sent His Son. That's why God came down in the flesh, because He wanted everyone to be saved. Like a good mom, our God and our God we need to display that sacrificial love for others. You say, what do you mean? Hang on, you just said, you said moms and, gods are, and God is alike because they're both sacrificially loving. Now you're telling us we need to display that love too? Yes, but it's only possible one way. It's only possible one way. When Jesus died on the cross, what He did was He paid for your sins. And so now, this morning even, you can get saved. In fact, we're going to do a couple baptisms this morning for a couple kids that got saved. Children here in our church. And you know how they did it? You say, oh, well, what? they had to do a lot of work for that, didn't they? No, no. Five-year-old Rayleigh got saved the same way that 15-year-old Brother Stephen did. You say, how is that? Well, for me, my story is pretty simple. I sat down. I knew the plan of salvation. So I said, God, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I acknowledge that you are real. That you really did live and die for my sins. And I'm asking you to save me from my sins. My, my prayer was really that simple. And when I lifted my head from that prayer in that church van back in 2008, I was saved. Now for a five-year-old like Rayleigh or Parker, their prayer might have sounded a little different. Your prayer is not going to be exactly what I said. But here's the, here's the bottom line. Getting saved is not something that you can earn. In fact, could you imagine a heaven where everybody earned their way? I, I, I don't even want to go to a heaven where everybody earned their way. So when you get there, everybody's like, Oh, well, I got here because I gave X amount of dollars to the church while I was alive. Oh, I, I got here because I helped, I helped 238 old women cross streets. I got here because I was really respectful to my mom. No, we all get to heaven the same way. And it's very simple this. You acknowledge that you're a sinner, which we all pretty much already agreed, we all are. And you ask Jesus, believing that He really did live and die for your sins. God became flesh and died for your sins. Ask Him, believing that, to save you. And it's that simple. You said, that, that's too easy. Yeah, I know. Sometimes that's the problem with salvation. That's why a lot of people won't believe. Because they want it to be difficult. They want it to be hard. They want it to be something where they can say, I did this. But it's something that's actually humbling when you acknowledge, God, I can't do it. In fact, I, 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 I encourage you, try to live by the Ten Commandments. Just the Ten Commandments. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you may get away with not murdering somebody. Maybe. Hopefully. <laughs> you might have that one nailed. But here on Mother's Day, I venture to say there was probably a point in your life, maybe as a teenager, where you didn't respect your parents. 
I've told the story of the last time I got a spanking. I was 16 because I yelled at my mom. And she said, you know what you need? You need a spanking. And I said, you want to use my belt? <laughs> and she did. <laughs> and then after she spanked me, she took my keys and my phone and then had to give me a ride to work. <laughs> I broke that commandment right there. I, I did long before that, but I'm saying I can nail down a day I broke the commandment to just honor my father and my mother. I didn't that day. My point being this, you're not going to be able to earn your way there. But, but just like a mom, God had sacrificial love. He would rather die and suffer than for you to die and suffer. Jesus Christ took all the sin of all mankind on himself. So you don't have to. Now, everyone has a choice. Today, you can choose I would rather go and burn in hell. That's your choice. There are some people that say that they want to. My pastor, uh, who was just here for our missions conference, he uh, invited. He was talking to some young men, and they were all. He knocked on their door, and there was a bunch of young men in the living room, and they were all, "Oh, we, we want to go to hell. We'll just party with our buddies all in hell." And so he said, "Could I borrow that lighter?" And he he turned on the light. Said, "Put your hand over that fire for a minute." No, I'm not going to do that. Well, hell is that all over you for eternity. He said, trust me, you don't want to go there. It's not a place of parting. And I'm encouraging you today. I want you to know, God's not sending you to hell. It's a choice you make. Right. It's you trust in Jesus Christ, His Son, and you can go to heaven, or you can say, I'll try to get there on my own, and you're, you're going to fall short. He doesn't... Let's use the Grand Canyon as an example of man's sin. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter if you're it, me at 28 years old. I may be able to run and jump further across the canyon than Brother Dave can. Maybe. I don't know. He's got calves for days, so he may be able to jump further than me. But no matter what, we're both missing the mark of the other side. And you may look around you and say, but I'm a lot better than them, and I'm a lot better than them, and I'm a lot better than them. And God's saying, that's not the standard. You may get a little further. You may be a little better, but you're falling short of perfection. You're still a sinner. So I'd encourage you this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, today is a great day to learn that. Today is a great day to learn that. Uh, we're going to have an invitation in a few moments. And uh, Brother Frank will be up here. I'm going to step back to do a baptism. But Brother Frank, can, if you're a man, he can have a man sit down with you and show you from the Bible how you can be saved. If you're a woman, he can have a woman. If you're a family, we can have somebody counsel your whole family. If you're a child, you can bring your parents and you can talk to somebody or a teenager. Anybody's welcome to get saved today. We'd love to have somebody show you, not Peakview Baptist Church's way, not Pastor Stephen's way, but what the Bible says about getting saved and going to heaven. We'll just show you scripture and tell you that's, that's about it. We'd love to do that today. As I said, we need to be showing that sacrificial love. The only way to do that is to be saved. I, I can't love my wife apart from God showing me how to love. I can't love you guys apart from God showing me how to love you. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, I, I've always loved my kids. or my, my parents weren't Christians and they love me. Yeah, no, I understand that. But I'm saying true sacrificial love is not something that we're born with. In fact, many marriages fail because we find out that love is not something that's easy, is it? <laughs> Even if it's your kids, moms, you understand, dads, you understand. As much as I love them, I don't like them today. <laughs> I've come home and I've, how's today? And my wife looks at me and says, I don't like them today. <laughs> Mainly talking about my son, and that's fine, because he's a lot like his father, and that makes sense. But I want to encourage us. Our, our, our theme this year is growing by grow, going. And that's not just talking about numerically. We'd love to grow numerically, but that's not our goal. But growing spiritually, too. Growing to be more like Christ. Maturing to be more like Christ. And here's the truth. You're not going to be able to do that outside of learning how to sacrificially love like God did. Here's what the Bible says in 1 John 4, 7-11. through 11. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Meaning, this is how God proved His love towards us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. 
Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Verse 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If we want to be a church that's growing and going, we're going to have to do it in love. So, like a mom, let's love others. Hey, love visitors. I know some of you are visitors, so this is for our church members, but treat them great no matter who they are. Or what, what standard of living they look like they come from. Or, or what, how they look or sound or act or what state they're from. Or what their, what their, hey, I'm serious about it. What their political view is, they still should be loved. No, I know there's a lot of things we like to say, oh, I don't, I don't want to love them because they're this and they're that and they're this. Hey, God just said we're supposed to love one another. He loved us before we ever loved Him. I wasn't born into this world loving God. I was born into this world loving self. Again, if you don't believe me, example A is the two-year-old downstairs who's right now probably arguing to get his way. You know, it takes a small degree of sacrifice to sit next to somebody at lunch that you're not familiar with. Somebody that you don't know well. To sit down with them and say, carry on random conversations. How'd you find our church? You know, where are you from? Or, you know, I, you, it takes a little bit of sacrifice to do that. It's a lot easier to sit next to your family, your friends, and talk with them, isn't it? It takes a little bit of sacrifice to love each other in the church. <laughs> now, this one's all hard. Some of y'all don't know how unloving or how hard you are to love. Just being honest. <laughs> Preachers have a hard job. Say, what do pastors do all week? We pray and ask God to help us love the people that he puts in the pews. <laughs> Just kidding. It takes sacrifice to go out of your way to visit someone who hasn't been faithful, who's going through a hard time, or to pick up somebody who can't get to church on their own. This is the example the mother here in the passage and our God gave us. As a church, if we're looking to grow, if we're looking to uh, mature spiritually, if we're looking to see even numerical growth, which would be a praise of the Lord, it's not going to come unless we're loving folk. Look, I don't mind if somebody leaves our church and says, I didn't agree with what they said about the Bible. I didn't agree with what they said about God. I didn't agree with what they said about salvation. If they leave because they don't agree with those things... There's not, that, that's fine. There's nothing we can do about that. We're not changing our position. But if somebody leaves our church and says, I don't want to go back there because those people weren't very inviting. Those people weren't very warm or welcoming. In fact, they kind of seem like they didn't even want me to be there. If that's the testimony our church ever has, we will never grow. And in fact, we're, we are on a fast track to death. A church that is following the example of, of God and a good mother will never have its growth stunted. Because a mom's love and God's love just doesn't stop. When your kids are stinkers, it doesn't stop. When your kid looks at you in the face and says no, and you're done beating them, it doesn't stop. Amen. You still love them. So here's my encouragement, and then we'll get into our invitation. Moms, thank you for teaching us how to love and sacrifice. Happy Mother's Day. But here's my encouragement. We have to love like a mother. We have to love like a mother. Because that's the only kind of love that makes for church growth. Because moms, good moms at least, love like our God. Let's stand together if you would. Stand together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to dismiss our kids that are going to go get baptized. If you want to take them back, Miss Julie. I want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you may be a little nervous about thinking of maybe trusting Jesus as your Savior today. That's, that's, that could be a big step if I've never done it. Well, it is a big step. It's the, most, it's the most important thing you'll ever do in your life. But I'm telling you, it's not hard. The hardest part is just getting past our own pride to walk down the aisle and say, I need to get saved. But we want to tell you, we only get excited when people get saved. We never laugh at people. I, I thought I made a profession of faith at seven and then again at 15. And when I got saved, actually got saved at 15, nobody looked at me and said, what are you doing? You didn't get saved when you're actually seven? No, everybody just said, praise the Lord. We're excited for you. We're happy for you. Welcome to the family of God. So I want to encourage you. I'm going to pray. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, today would be a great day to get that settled. 
And if you do know Jesus as your personal Savior, and if you are somebody that's faithful to our church, you ought to be loving like a mom and like God. Sacrificial love that helps build and grow a church. That helps people feel welcomed and know that even if they don't feel loved out there, they're loved in here. Because God loves them and we love them. And if you're not a loving person, maybe you need to get that right today. These pews, this old-fashioned altar. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. God, I ask that you would just... If, if you've been working on somebody's heart, maybe about the need to get saved today, Lord, that you would give them the courage to step out of their seats, to come forward, to trust you as their personal Savior. And God, if somebody here is, who's faithful to our church, who's a regular or a member, but their attitude is not one that they're inviting and loving and sacrificially loving others, I ask that you'd help them to get that right so that more people are drawn to God's love. And hopefully know that here at PP Baptist Church, they'll find God's love. God, work in this invitation time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother